guys. So today on Her Best Fucking Life, we have Miss Susan Hyatt, who just published her newest book, Bear, which is all about loving your body, being healthy from a place of love rather than diets and negativity and hatred and talking down on ourselves. And I am all about this movement right now. And we're going to get into it a lot in this episode, but I'm going to hand it over to Susan, let her introduce herself and tell you guys a little bit more about her. Hi, I'm so thrilled to be here, Sarah. Thank you for having me on your amazing podcast and sharing your amazing audience with me. Yes. We're so excited to have you here. Yay. So I am a life coach. I'm about to celebrate my 12 year anniversary as a life coach and as you know, an author. And 12 years ago, when I started in this industry, I was just doing basic general life coaching, you know, build the life that you want. And in that first year, I had about 40 extra pounds on me. And I really was curious about what that was about. Um, Prior to becoming a life coach, I was a residential real estate agent. And prior to that, I worked in marketing and PR. And with both of those careers, I definitely used food to cope with stress and emotion. And I found myself um, the mom of two outrageous out of the box little kids and um, trying to sell houses and do all the things. And I was coping in the afternoons by Um, eating a wheel of brie and drinking a bunch of wine. (laughs) And that was was problematic. (laughs) And so I hired my own weight loss coach. I was already a life coach at the time. And it was so transformative that I decided to start helping other women do the same. But over the course of the next decade, what I noticed was that even if I helped a woman lose weight, it was never enough. It was never enough weight. Then she would focus on aging or stretch marks or something that was wrong with her physical body. So unless we were dealing with a lot of the deeper inner issues, it didn't matter what the scale weight was. Um, And I curated a process called BEAR, which is what the book is about. And it's a seven-step process to help women really get their power back. I am absolutely loving the book. You guys, I got an advanced uh, digital copy of it. So I'm about finishing it right now, but I just love it so much because kind of like you said, I think so many people lose weight for the appearance or for the, you know, for the number on the scale. And then if you don't address those deeper rooted images that are really pushing you to want to lose weight, Mm -hmm. it's never, like you said, it's never going to be enough. It's never going to fix it. It's never enough. And and it's interesting because most women, when you ask them why they want to lose weight, there's a pause and they can't really answer. It's, It's because they think that's what they're supposed to do. I mean, from birth, we're really trained that our success is based on how effective we are at shrinking our physical form. So think about that. You're more valuable as a woman, the smaller you shrink yourself. Mm -hmm. And so this really is about expansion. It's about life gain and not weight loss. And, and so when I started really, um, creating and developing this process, it was really transformative for me as well, considering that I have a son and a daughter, they're now 20 and 18. My daughter who is 18, when she was 10, she came home from school and said, she had heard enough body positivity out of me up to this point that she said, Hey mom, um, now keep in mind, these are nine and 10 year old girls. She said, um, every girl at the cafeteria table today didn't eat her lunch and they all made a pact that they were going to be on a diet together. Oh no. Like, That's messed up. Right. <laughs> like, right. Well, at least, so, yeah, at least she knew that, you know, she knew, but these young girls are, are coming up and even though they know for example, on Instagram, that it's Photoshop, that there are filters and all those things, even though they intellectually understand it, they still do the compare and despair thing and think that they somehow don't measure up. And so I'm really out on a mission to free every girl and woman from that kind of body and food drama. Yeah. And it's so funny. I'm going to touch on this a little bit because this is actually something I've never shared with any of my audience, readers, followers, anything. I know this is kind of juicy. And I was like, I'm going to dig it up today because I think I've like referenced to it in my first book, Sober as Fuck, but like I never really dove into it. But like when I was preteen, so like 12, 13 years old, I was very heavily involved in dance. Mm -hmm. And you know, a dancer's body, like tall, skinny, I'm five feet tall. I am not that body. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm smart too. I'm yeah. like five, 
two and a half. Yeah. So I'm super tiny and my family has always loved to eat. Let's just be honest. And there was a time period where I can remember around that, that age where I would only eat like things like a can of lima beans for lunch, or I would only eat dry cereal until dinner time. And I was weighing myself every single day. And it, it's in, I, I think it hits people at all ages, but I think especially at that young age where you're so easily impacted by those things and you want to be liked and you want to be pretty. And you're, you know, I struggled with that for a really, really long time. And thankfully I, I remember one time I tried to make myself sick and I hate throwing up. I am like the biggest baby. I cry. And so thankfully I wasn't able to do it. So I never tried again, but for a lot of people, you know, that can lead into eating disorders and so many unhealthy things. And thankfully I was able to kind of snap out of it. I actually quit dance eventually because of it. But, you know, I had that experience and I feel like so many young people have that experience too. Well, I mean, if you think about it, women, I mean, we're steeped in diet culture from birth. So there's, there's no one that has not been exposed to whether it's through media, now social media, but TV, magazines, peer conversations. So even if you come from a household where um, the conversation around food and body is super healthy, that's very rare mm -hmm. uh, because our mothers have been raised this way and teach us um, these things. But let's just say I have had a few clients that were like, I didn't get this from my family of origin. I actually got this from a sport, like you're saying, or dance mm -hmm. or cheerleading or my peer group. And, um, and there, if you think about all the different fads and all the different diets that exist and the current ones are, you know, intermittent fasting and keto and paleo and all these things, mm -hmm. when we put all these rules, the ex these external rules in place that we have to follow. So if you can mess it up, it's a diet. People want to argue with me all the time that their quote unquote lifestyle change is not a diet. And I'm like, oh, can you mess it up? Because if you can mess it up, it's a fucking diet. Yeah. Let's just be clear. Uh, <laughs> but so, you know, many of you may be subscribing to those things right now. This isn't in an effort to shame you. It's just in an effort to wake you up that if you're basing your self-worth on how well you can follow an external program, you're really missing out on rocking your goals and focusing on other things because, you know, while all of these young girls are focused on thigh gap, they're not paying attention to wage gap. And that's where the focus needs to be. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. <laughs> so it's fun because I think, I do think in recent years, we've gotten more accepting. You know, you see people like Ashley Graham, who's not super skinny and loves her body. So I think we have made progress in it, but I still think we have a very long way to go with a lot of people, unfortunately. Well, I think we do. And I agree with you. One of the things I'm proud of with my daughter is that, and one of the things I teach in Bear is that, you know, you do something called an environmental detox where you go through and you pay attention, like, what am I watching? What kind of music am I listening to? What kinds of conversations am I having? And one little slice of that is curating your Instagram or your Facebook or your Snapchat so that the things that you're seeing are things that make you feel great. And so she has curated her Instagram feed with women of all shapes and sizes and colors. And Ashley Graham is one of the women that we both love to follow. Um, and so if, if this is new information to any of your listeners, um, the body positivity movement has made a ton of strides. We wanna, there's so far to go with it. And I feel like Bear is a good entry point for people who want to start learning how to think about their bodies in a different way. Yeah, I completely agree. So I actually saw, it was really funny because before I even any of this knew who you were, I saw someone post a picture of your book cover probably a month or so ago, like way before all of this. And I saw it and honestly, I was like, that's a fucking cute cover. Like I'm all about a cute cover. So it was pink and there was a bathtub and you were laying in it. And I was like, oh, this is so cute. And honestly, like just seeing the word bear, I was like, okay, what is this about? You know, cause it was so cute. It drew me in. And then when I really started reading it and then I started following you on social media and I was like, oh, this is going to be good. So thank you. I yeah. appreciate that about the cover because that cover was a struggle to get. Oh, I'm sure. Um, my, publisher, <laughs> my publisher had a very different idea of what the cover should look like. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they sent four to eight mock-ups of a cover. And I, it was, 
not good. Let's just say it was not good. And I said, let me guess, a young male designed this cover. <laughs> and I was like, absolutely not. And so we, my team, we took it back over and, and, and they also didn't like the pink. And I was like, you just, you don't understand my audience. So you just, you know, confirm for me. I feel like the pink cover and the fun vibe of it will help draw people in. And then oh, it's yeah. like really meaty underneath that. Yeah. Cause that's honestly, initially I didn't know what bear meant and I was like, Oh, this is a cute cover. But then once I got in, I was like, Oh, this is gold. Like this is so gold. Thank so you. one of the things that you talk about a lot in the book that I just love so much because I am all about the body positivity, the love, the positivity all over mm -hmm. is that you say so many times in the book, what feels like love. Yeah. And I love it. Oh my God. I love it so much. Thank you. It's such a great question. And it, and I use it, honestly, I use it every single day. So um, the question that Sarah's mentioning, what feels like love can be directed towards what are you eating? How are you moving your body? What are you doing for a living? Who are you intimate with? Who are your friends? Like, does this, what I'm currently doing, does this feel like love? And honestly, there are some days when I'm in the middle of doing something that I'm like, actually, no, this doesn't feel like love at all. So I need to make some changes here. And what feels like love doesn't mean we're sitting around eating bonbons all day, not working. I mean, what feels like love could mean uh, going for a run, or it could mean taking a nap, but I think it means something different to everybody. And it's a really, it's a guiding principle of the bear process. Right. And I think it, it's such a kind of open-ended where people can apply it anywhere. Like you said, it's like, oh, it's going to be so different for every person and they're going to play it into their life in so many different ways that, yeah, you could do it with your job, with everything and be like, is this feeling good? Is this feeling positive? And if it's not, mm -hmm. it's maybe something you need to work on or shift in your life. Right. Because my former career as a residential real estate agent, I was good at it. Mm -hmm. But after a couple of years, I, it was really clear to me that it was not my calling. It was not what I was meant to be doing. And, you know, what feels like love could be your career. And I had a real wake up call where I was like, is this, I remember I was, I had this big Toyota Sequoia with all my real estate signs rattling in the back and my kids were in car seats and I'm driving and I'm like on my, remember blackberries? I was yes. on my blackberry. So this would have been, you know, 17 years ago, you know, arguing with another real estate agent about a termite report or something. And I looked in the rear view mirror and I looked at my kids' faces and I was like, this is not how I want them to remember their mother, like mm -hmm. screaming into a cell phone, driving like a maniac. And so many of you listening, I mean, you may be in careers that you know in your heart is not what you're meant to be doing. And so that question I hope can wake some of you up and, and that you can make changes. Yeah, I agree. Cause I think a lot of us, we get complacent. We get, mm -hmm. oh, I'm already doing this. Oh, I already, you know, I have benefits. I have insurance. I'm, I'm comfortable here. It's safe. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing for me. Like I'm all about take the risk, figure out what you're really meant to do rather than just sitting in something because you're already there. Right. Absolutely. So you talk a lot in the book about how to have more pleasure in your life and how that's such a crucial thing in the bear process. And two things that I talk about a lot that my listeners will know immediately are baby life upgrades and dating yourself. And I feel like that could go so hand in hand with that chapter of your book. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little bit more about this. What, what, what were you thinking when you went into this chapter? What were the things in your life that you discovered were bringing you pleasure? And how did you kind of shift this? Because something I notice a lot is people find a lot, feel a lot of guilt around it when they first yeah. start doing this. And that's something I've talked about a lot. So I want to hear your input on it as well. Yeah. So when I first created the bear process, it was really only six weeks, six steps. Mm -hmm. And I knew something was missing. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I mean, pleasure is the foundation of all the work I do with my clients. And so I added it in early in the process because it's my opinion that women really do not need more willpower. They need more pleasure. And the mm -hmm. more I can get women devoted to their own pleasure, the more their lives are going to change. And if you have goals around food and body, pleasure is the way. So, so often, and I was a woman who subscribed to this belief that like, I just needed to like 
bear down, knuckle down and have more willpower. And I could finally have the body of my dreams. And so much of the health, fitness and diet industry is built on this core belief that you got to have willpower. And it, I mean, I know, you know, from your own life and your listeners, women are running their homes, communities, boardrooms, like we've got willpower in spades. What we don't have, because like you said, we're made to feel guilty if we put ourselves first, is we don't, we're not devoted to pleasure. And again, often when I say pleasure, people's minds automatically go to sex, which intimacy, <laughs> is, intimacy is part of pleasure, yes. But yeah. physical touch, that's really only one category. I mean, you may need intellectual pleasure, you may need um, physical movement, you may need an upgrade in spirituality. Um, you may need, yes, pleasurable foods because women are so often depriving themselves. And I think that with my client audience, women tend to believe that they have to be on the back burner because their kids or their marriage or their job is on the front burner. And honestly, if a woman puts herself on the front burner, everyone benefits, everyone gets a front burner. But we're shamed often if we take time for ourselves and if we become devoted to our own pleasure and, and if we like ourselves, right? It's so pathetic how women are brainwashed into thinking that we have to be so self-sacrificing. And especially if you're a mother, everything's about the kids. Nothing can be about you. And you better, you know, fall in line because the mommy wars are going to come after you. And so for me, what I know for sure is the body is wired for pleasure. And when we deny that, whether it's food, comfort, movement, sex, you name it, when we deny that, we start to get sick, we start to get depressed, and we're not able to work at our full capacity. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that maybe nowadays we're getting more comfortable with. Because when I think back to like when my mom was raising us, my mm -hmm. mom ne never put herself first. Never. It was like, no, I'm, I'm supposed to be home. I'm supposed to take care of my kids. I'm a mother. I'm a wife. Right. And exactly. I, yeah. I mean, my mom, and honestly, my mom is 76. And I just did a book signing event in my original hometown of Savannah, Georgia. And my whole family was there. My dad's like 80, my mom, you know, my great aunts, all the, and they are, they are so shocked by the things that come out of my mouth. It's almost hilarious to watch. But my mother is like, I don't get it, but I'm supportive. You know, like she doesn't, she really doesn't understand a lot of what my generation and your generation, what we're, what we're doing. Yeah. They're, they're very sort of like, well, back when I was raising y'all, you know, yes. we, we blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, it's a new freaking day, mama. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah. And you were like, had mama's little helper getting you through like this. is Right. Like, right. You know, no drugs and alcohol to get through the day. <laughs> right. No. And yeah, I mean, it's 2019 now. I always tell my mom because my mom's the same way. My mom is in her mid sixties. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of times because like, um, my first book, sober as fuck is about my sobriety. And I talk yeah. all about how I got sober. And my mom was like, oh, no, like, how dare you? Right. Right. <laughs> and right. She you don't, so, you don't air no. your dirty laundry. Oh, no. she was so upset about like, I mean, she got over it and now she's super right. proud. But at first right. it was like, oh my God, Sarah, like you should not put that much of yourself out there. You should not say right. those things. You should not talk about that. So I totally, I feel what you're saying about your mom. Cause it's that generational right. gap that like, they were raised such a different way in everything to how the generation is today mm -hmm. and are around our age that's doing this stuff that it, it cracks me up because they just freak out sometimes. And I, I think they it's do. pretty funny. They do. And I catch myself with my 18 year old. I mean, honestly, she's such a role model for me. She, her name is Cora. And she, a lot of the stories I share are about Cora mm -hmm. because she, she has really brought me along. Like any level of wokeness that I have honestly is because of this child, because she, she'll, she'll say like, you realize that's thin shaming, right? Or you realize like she, through she calls you out <laughs> as, totally like she has schooled me and I still have so much to learn. Even though I've written this book, I'm still learning every day. Um, but she, I imagine she'll have her own mom stories 
How funny. That's like, that's hilarious. So let's talk about food. Okay. Because I, when I was reading the food chapter, I feel like I'm already there with this, but it took me a long time to get there. But the whole power food versus pleasure food and how you can have both and you don't need to deprive yourself. And that's one thing that I've talked about. Like I'm always, I'm tiny. Like I've never been, you know, needing to lose a lot of weight, but I like to be healthy. So, but at the same time, like I will eat pizza and I will eat tacos and burgers and all those things. And I love that you talk about it in the book because so many people label these things as like, oh my God, don't eat fries. Right. And you wrote so much about fries in the book that I was like, (laughs) this is my girl. <laughs> yeah. You and I can hang out. I can tell. Yeah, we could. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. I just, as I mentioned, just got back from Savannah and I had fried chicken and sweet tea and yes. Leopold's ice cream and all the things. Um, so the way that I talk about food, because we are raised with such dysfunction around food that these are good foods and these are bad foods. And if you haven't noticed that changes, it changes mm-hmm. all the time, depending um, that when we eliminate entire food groups, unless there's a legitimate health concern, it can create eating disordered, you know, disordered eating. And Mm -hmm. so I don't label foods good and bad. I label them power or pleasure power, meaning when I eat these foods, I feel powerful. I feel energized or this food is strictly for pleasure and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and that can, you know, so much of what I'm trying to do is to get women to stop operating according to someone else's external plan and figure out their own and take their power back because a nutritionist can come up with an 1800 calorie diet for you and I to eat. And you are probably going to feel really different consuming some Mm -hmm. of those foods than I am. Cause there's certain foods that aren't optimal for me that might be for you. And it's this blanket sort of no sugar whatsoever, or, you know, carbs are the devil or whatever it might be this decade. And it's nonsense. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. If you practice moderation and control somewhat, you're going to be fine. I always tell people, I'm like, do you know how many times we eat foods that aren't healthy, like during the week in our household? And people are like, but you eat so healthy so much. And I'm like, no, we got pizza yesterday. Right. (laughs) Yeah, I I cook a lot, but no, like I don't believe in deprivation because if you take something out like that, it's like telling a child they can't touch something. It becomes like they fixate on it. That's all you want. You, you know, people that go on diets and are like, I'm not going to have any cookies. One day you're going to eat half a package of cookies. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's. For every deprivation, there is an equal and opposite binge. Mm-hmm. So you might be able to white knuckle it for even a couple years, but you have to start asking yourself what is sustainable and w- joyful. Like we're not meant to live in a way where we're constantly like hoarding almonds and, you know, weighing apples and doing this crazy stuff. I mean, you guys, it's the amount of time and energy that women spend doing that. We could have already closed the wage gap. We could already be running that White House. You could already do whatever, fill in the blank, have that lake house, write that book, whatever it is. And um, I think that it provides a convenient distraction. Like, oh, I'm just going to fixate over here on how many macros so I don't have to deal with the uncomfortable feelings I'm having about my marriage or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. No, I love it. So I also loved the chapter about exercise, moving your body. I totally tagged you in my Insta story this morning when I was running. I loved it. (laughs) Beyonce for the win. I know because that's the thing. Like, do I love working out all the time? No, but like you say in the book, like you've got to do things that feel good to you. So like we live in this weird little island in Michigan. That's kind of like small town country. It's kind of, it's really fucking weird, but it's cute. But, but you're on an island. Yes. Weird little island, but I fucking love it. But surrounded by water, surrounded by boats. First of all, I have been obsessed with water since I was a child. I just like to be near it. And I have driven on this island when I first got my driver's license, like every single week just to drive, you know? Mm -hmm. But I love being by water. So something I do is I run by the water here. Mm -hmm. And I love it. Like I look forward to that more than I do like, hey, I'm going to do a run on the treadmill for a half hour. Right. So I I loved your idea. Like, you know, you've got to find the things that feel good, that make you feel like they are loved, that feel good to you. 
And for me, it's running by the water. But I loved that idea in that chapter all about the things that feel good and not making yourself do the things that you absolutely hate. Yeah. And, and so for me, I was a professional couch potato. Like I was such a brat about movement and exercise that it's a near and dear mission for me to get women moving because I was convinced that women who worked out a lot were shallow, like that I had better things to do. It's so ridiculous, but this is what I had built up in my mind as an excuse. And when I did start moving my body, I, I realized that what I needed to drop was not exercise. What I needed to drop was the transactional relationship that I had with my body around movement, meaning, oh, I'll do the stair stepper, but I better have JLo's butt by Friday. <laughs> and that never happened. And so I would quit and women put these unrealistic transactional goals out there for their bodies. Like, I'm only going to move you if you shape up and look like this instead of I'm going to move you because you're a creature and you're built to move and it's good for my mental health and it feels good. Now I get that people listening to a lot of people, it doesn't feel good at first. It's awkward. You feel clumsy. You feel like my thighs are running together or whatever. It gets better the more you do it. And then you start to process all the emotion that's stuck in your body. And now People, when they meet me, they're shocked to hear that I was so obstinate about working out. In fact, I told my first coach, you can't make me like a little <laughs> kid. Like you can't make me I'm not doing it. Um, and now I'm a runner too. So mm -hmm. I love to run and I also love to spin and lift weights and, but it could be anything. It could be dancing in your living room. Right. And yeah, like coming, doing it from a place of taking care of yourself and feeling good rather than working out for like a physical result of like, well, I'm only doing this because I want abs. Right. <laughs> like, you know, because that, that is boring as hell and no. that's never going to last. No, that's not fun. So you cover, I, I feel like I could go all the step through all the steps with this would be a really <laughs> long interview. So we're not going to, we're not going to go through all of them. Okay. But I also loved one, the one about um, going through your closet and going through your clothes and the things that make you feel good because I have recently turned 30 mm -hmm. and I did a whole podcast episode about this where I went through the de-hoeing of my closet. Oh my God. I have to link <laughs> to that in my group because we're doing closet yeah. detox right now. And oh, I'll, I'll email it. I'll email Send it to, it to me. De-hoeing. I, I am loving this. Well, cause I was a club rat. I was a bar fly. I went out with my girlfriends, crop tops, high heels. Like that was me. And yep. so it was like, okay, but I'm 30 now. So I should probably not do this anymore. Girl, you can hoe it up at 30, but I I'm getting what you're saying. <laughs> you can hoe it up at 30. But what I found when I was putting these things on was when I used to drink a lot, I did uh -huh. it and I dressed that way for the attention. Right. It wasn't from a place of, I feel good in this. It was, guys are going to look at me. Girls are going to look at me. I'm going to have all the attention on me. Right. So when I started going through these things again, now that I'm sober, I'm older, it was like, I can't wear this shit anymore. Like right. it, it reads to me when I put it on myself, it reads to me as like desperate yeah. <laughs> and like, yeah. girl, you're still trying to hold on to your youth. Like you can't wear forever 21 outfits, like to the parents PTA meeting. Let's be honest. <laughs> No, those PTA moms, <laughs> trust me. There those will be PTA a Facebook moms. group about it. Like it will be yeah. the talk of the school. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. I, you know, what's interesting is that absolutely when I, I have people go to their closet and think about like, what's the story my wardrobe is telling? So mm -hmm. obviously there was a story of desperation that you were like, you know what? Now that I'm sober, this doesn't feel good. Um, but what's interesting is that women typically have aspiration clothing. So yeah. clothes like, oh, if I just lose that last, whatever it is, 10, 20 pounds, I'm going to get into that again. And when they look at it, it makes them feel terrible. Um, or if they're like me, I had like every size and stacks of jeans of varying sizes. And so what I want to encourage women to do is get it at anything that doesn't fit or spark joy. It's got to go. Oh, Marie Kondo. Marie Kondo. Yes. I did it. Yes. <laughs> so, so, and I take it so seriously because there really is an energetic, magical quality to the, what you're putting against your skin. So even my workout clothes are banging because I'm like, if I'm going to be in this all day, I'm going to feel good in it. But so many women are like, oh, I'm not going to go shopping and do that, Susan, until I lose the weight. No, ma'am. You need to dress and adorn yourself for today and feel amazing today. And if ho wear 
makes you feel desperate, it's got to go. But if hoeware makes you feel great, put it on. <laughs> like, whatever. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta wear what you like. And I know exactly what you're saying. Cause when you put on something like, even if it's sometimes it's new, sometimes it's not, but that one pair of jeans that you just like feel good in, you yes. put it on and you're like, it's just like a breath of fresh air, like a boost of confidence. Like you feel good. And I know people will complain that like, well, you shouldn't have to like put on a certain outfit to feel a certain, just to feel good, but it does play into it. It absolutely does. There actually, I'm going to see if I can find it, but there was an NPR podcast where they talked about the energetic quality and magic of clothing. Like when people have a lucky hat yes. or that favorite pair of jeans, or like I have a, a silver cuff that I wear that kind of looks like a Wonder Woman cuff that when I do speaking gigs, if I slap that on, it's like an immediate boss mode takes over. And so, yeah, it's the clothing triggers thoughts that create your feelings. So if you're walking around like I was wearing stuff that I thought made me look professional and covered me up so I could hide, that's how you're going to behave in the world. Mm -hmm. And so it, no amount of thought work is going to, like, if you are doing thought work, you're picking out things that you love. So I, I literally just pulled it up on my phone so I could remember her name. So I didn't go say it wrong, but have you been following Jamila, Jamil. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> I knew you were going to love her. As soon as we started talking and we were talking a little bit before we started uh, recording about like the MLM and like all the stuff they try to sell you. I live for her Instagram page. When oh she my God. Posts, she, she is the best. And have I you seen it. the I Way her I Way movement? Yes. I love so it. I had my community do that. And she is literally like, she doesn't know it, but we're going to become very best friends over, <laughs> over. Oh, this. for sure. But she, she is hilarious and she is so smart and articulate. I absolutely encourage everybody to follow her. And I do love how she's calling out celebrities about peddling diet, like the Kardashians with the suckers and the, the diet drinks and stuff like that. It's, it's so harmful to young women. It is. I laughed so hard when she was posting all the pictures where she was like sitting on the toilet, <laughs> making jokes about the diet teas and funny, like funny story. I'm going to own up to it because when I first got involved in social media, I did most of my stuff on YouTube. Right. And so naturally I started getting approached by some companies and right. Of course, one of them was a diet tea company who I don't post about them anymore. Obviously, I've come very far. That was like 25 years old. Right. But I'm going to, like, I'll own it. I was one of those people for a little while posting pictures of me holding my diet tea. And now I look yeah. back and I'm like, girl, what the fuck? <laughs> no, I mean, listen, again, like your listeners, please hear us. Like, we're not, if you're involved in this right now or if you drink the tea or, chew on the suckers. Like we're not trying to shame anybody because again, women are brainwashed to think this is what we need to do. It's more mm -hmm. like, let's just all wake up. And I've certainly done and said, I mean, I'm 45. I look back, like sometimes there'll be a Facebook memory and I'm like, oh my God, scrub the internet because I can't <laughs> believe I ever said that because we just grow and expand as humans. And that's just part of it. But I love that. Um, that look how far in a short amount of time you've come with your awareness that you're like, yeah, that's not a good right. thing. Right. Not, not a good thing. <laughs> not, not okay to be showing people like, Hey, just drink this tea and look, look all the things that'll happen for you in your life. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I, I just think it's hilarious. And I think there is such a push. I feel like maybe there's not as much anymore. It's getting a little bit better, but there is such a push for like shakes, teas, all these things that people are like selling the wraps. There's so many things that are sold on the internet that I think for the young girls, it can be like, I'm okay to laugh about it now, but for like a 16 year old out there, she's probably like, Oh, maybe I should order this. Maybe I should do this, you know? And right. that's, or, that's the scary part. Or as dramatic as cosmetic surgery, you right. know, maybe I should get implants in all the places. And, you mm -hmm. know, for women, my age, it's interesting. I, I often think about how we're, we're not going to know what a real aging face is supposed to look like because everyone is, you know, Botox and fillers. And, mm -hmm. and I haven't gone that route and I'm not, you know, I am a firm believer that if a woman wants to do that, 
and she's a grown woman. Like you go ahead and do what makes you, you do you boo. Right. Um, but I, but it is kind of weird to think about that a natural aging face, aging is part of this too. And not only are women taught that the smaller you are, the more valuable you are, but the younger you look, the more valuable you are. And so an aging woman's face and body is so discounted. And I'm really out to disrupt that as well. Like let's show our stretch marks and our crow's feet. And, you know, my photographers that I work with, there've been a couple of times that they've you know, they do some Photoshopping for color, for uh, light and coloring and that sort right. of thing. But there was this one time there was a new guy working on the scene and they Photoshopped the, I mean, I, that, oh. those photos came back and I had no line. Like, I was like, okay, gross, number one. And number two, <laughs> put my crow's feet back. All right. I earned those mofos. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, there's so much airbrushing. Oh my gosh. I love when they expose the photos though, which I mean, like, I'm sure some people hate that they expose them if it's them in the photo, but I love love when they, I love it. I love when they expose the celebrity photos where it's like before and afters and you realize how much they mess with the pictures to make them skinnier and smoother and tiny and big boobs. And it's like, holy shit. No wonder we all feel this way. I know. And I've, and I've had models as clients who agonize over like the tens of thousands of dollars they spend for their photos to be photoshopped in a way that the magazines will run them. And also actresses. um, I have a friend who lives in LA. She's a screenwriter. And she was basically saying like, I have friends who won't get together with me at certain times because they're like, oh, I'm I'm fasting. I'm non-eating this week because an award show is coming up or something. And so even in my own life, often for events and for photo shoots, I have someone doing my hair and someone doing my makeup and you know i'm constantly and perfect lighting and so i'm constantly saying to my audience or doing insta stories like you do where i'm like fresh face working out like this is what i actually look like this photo is the best possible version of me but that's not what i look like when i'm at the gym (laughs) right no yeah and that's that's like you said like i always am on insta stories pretty much daily with no makeup on right Right. And people have just grown to know that about me. And like this video will go on YouTube. I don't have any, I just got out of the shower. (laughs) And and honestly, I think that your audience, I'm sure loves you for it because Mm -hmm. I have women, although I did have one lady on Instagram say on one of my Insta stories, she private messaged me that I really needed to put some makeup on before doing an Insta story. And I screenshotted that and did a whole blog about it. Like, like, right. Like, excuse me, like, when are we not like, so we're not acceptable to show up bare face with our hair in a ponytail. That's what you're saying. Like, right. don't look, don't look. <laughs> I'm I always, so offensive. Right. No, it's so funny. I would do the same thing. I always tell people like, don't give me something to write a post about if you don't want me to post about it. <laughs> don't teach me kids, a lesson. Exactly. My kids are constantly like, don't put that on Facebook. Like everybody's like, wait, don't share that because it's all material. It is. No. And as we were talking about all these women though, like injecting themselves and airbrushing and all this stuff, that is one thing about your book that I think was just an add on and made it like the cherry on top was that in the book you have spread throughout it images of real women. That like, photo shoot was so fun. I can only imagine. I would have loved it because it's real women. They're not all super skinny. They have stretch marks. They have wrinkles. They have extra skin. And right you've spaced them out. So like, as I'm going through this book and I'm reading all this stuff about body love, and then I see these pictures of these women in there and they all are so beautiful and so happy Mm -hmm. and so confident. And it's like, this is what we need to be showing people more of. Yeah, it was, I actually, um, it was so, it was so rewarding to me. We ran an application contest process in my audience. Like who, who would like to be a bear model? And we went through all these applications and we really tried to represent all ages, all sizes, all races. Um, And watching that shoot was one of the most rewarding things to me because these women all bonded. They all had a great time. There were tears. There was so much joy. And um, I'm so like, I'm so desensitized now. Like I could be naked on social media and it wouldn't bother me. But so it's funny when somebody's like, oh, like you're in your bra. And I'm like, 
so. Um, but it was, it was a real commitment of ours as we put this project together that there would be no airbrushing, that we would show real bodies and celebrate that. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. When I came to the first one, I didn't, you know, I didn't know they were going to be in there. And then I saw the first one and I was like, oh yes. And then as each next one came, I was like, oh my God, this is so amazing that you included that in there. I thought it was so cool. Thank you. Awesome. Well, Susan, thank you so much for coming on today. Why don't you go ahead and tell everyone where they can find you, if they want to connect with you, follow you on social media. Her Instagram is great. I love watching it. It's very inspiring. Uh, Body positive. So where can everyone find you? So on Instagram and Facebook, it's at Susan Hyatt. I also have a pretty pop and Pinterest page, which Do is also you? at Susan Hyatt. Um, my website for the book is letsgetbear.com. And all of your listeners, um, if they, we're going to have some book bonuses for them, but there's a free class that I'm going to give that they can join in on and have a free month in the Bear Daily membership community. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Oh, I'm so excited for that. Oh, you guys jump on it. It's going to be bomb. All right. Well, Susan, thank you so much again for coming on and chatting. It was so much fun getting to talk and we will catch you guys in the next episode. All right. Thank you.